Hello, and welcome to another edition of Your Therapist Needs Therapy, a podcast where mental health professionals get together and talk about their mental health journeys. I'm Jeremy Schumacher, your host, licensed marriage and family therapist. And today I am joined by Erica Smith, who is a certified sex educator. Erica, thanks for joining me. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. I, I One of my specialties is religious trauma and the purity culture dropout program that you run. Yes. I'm so happy to hear that you specialize in religious trauma because I feel like it's difficult to find therapists who advertise that they specialize in religious trauma. And when I work with folks, I suggest very often that they do the work with me in tandem with therapy. And sometimes there's, depending on where they live, it's really hard to find someone to do that specific kind of work. Yeah, it's it's definitely niche. Like I'm in Wisconsin. I believe I'm the only uh, therapist who has any formal training in it. <laughs> um, and I know there's some states in the United States that don't have anyone still. So um, yes. it's a growing trend, but it's still it's still limited. But I, I love the work that you put out on on Instagram. Do you mind talking a little bit about like kind of how you got into the field and then like kind of how that shifted to working with with purity culture? Yeah, of course. So I, um, I've been a sex educator for my entire career. So that means that um, in college, I studied women and gender studies. I uh, knew, you know, sex education wasn't like a job that they tell you you can be when you're a kid, <laughs> especially not when I was young. You know, it wasn't like a career path that I saw clearly laid out in front of me. But I did find that I was very passionate about the topic of reproductive health and access to reproductive health. So it just kind of fell into place that I started my work um, first in abortion care, doing the counseling and education sessions for patients at the clinic. And eventually I began working in a sex ed HIV prevention program with youth. And then I discovered that right in the in the Philadelphia area, which is where I am, there is a a uh, graduate program for sex education and sex therapy, which, you know, I started that program in like 2004. It wasn't very widely known at the time. And so um, that's when I got my master's in sex education. And I've just always continued to be very, very into this work. The way that I became focused on folks growing up in purity culture or who came out of purity culture is because I just saw the need. Um, I'm not one of those people. I was not raised in purity culture, but I watched it really mess people up from the outside. And I watched the way the religious right has a strong grip on politics in America and how that affects funding for sexual health, uh, how that affects policy. And for years I was working in a grant funded HIV prevention program and we were losing funding to like abstinence only programs. So yeah. my viewpoint was as an outsider being like, this is probably messing people up a lot. And then I began, you know, I knew for a fact that abstinence only education didn't work and that was a product of, you know, the religious right. So I began asking people uh, a few years ago how how they grew up in regards to sex education. Did they grow up in what they would consider um, a very high control religion and in purity culture and how did it affect them? And I got such a strong response from people that I immediately was like, I see such like a, a gap in sex education that's tailored for these folks, for people yep. who might be adults that feel really ashamed that they don't know this stuff. So that is... That's my motivation. And um, so now I've been doing purity culture specific work uh, for a little over four years now. Yeah. Yeah. And like growing up in that, I grew up uh, evangelical. So like, definitely like we weren't what sex education and I'll put that in quotes I grew up with was anatomically incorrect and full of like scare tactics and really unhelpful stuff. And yeah. like, there wasn't any sort of formal sex ed. I think that was fourth or fifth grade. And I think we only got it because one girl got her period and our whole class like worked really hard to figure out what my doll was because none of us oh. knew what it was. It was like this this great mystery in our little evangelical Lutheran school. Um, that so must I think have our, been 
scandalous. <laughs> yeah, this poor, I look back on it, I'm like, this poor 10-year-old, 11-year-old who oh. was the first person to get her period and caused all this ruckus in our class. But I think, mm -hmm. like, it wasn't part of the curriculum. I think it was just because, like, our class <laughs> freaked out about, like, making this huge mystery out of it. Um, but I look back on it, and, and I know how unhelpful it is. And now, as I've deconverted and deconstructed myself, like, it is this fascinating thing where you have these people who are fully grown adults they're in relationships many of them have children and like they're just still grappling with this idea of even the difference between like i don't believe that stuff anymore but so much of that like purity culture stuff is just ingrained yes and it lives in their like deep in their bodies yeah yeah i talk about big t trauma and little t trauma a lot and how it's it's almost always like a little t trauma it's fascinating, I think, seeing how people change their belief systems, but then like the the idea of what they hold on to, like you talked about, it's it's in their bodies. Um, this little t trauma to me. Like we don't necessarily identify it as PTSD. A lot of people aren't necessarily looking at it as like my church harmed me. Yeah. But like those messages around like putting monogamy in a privileged space, putting um hetero relationships in a privileged space, like those things are hard to let go of because you're not necessarily aware that like oh i've been indoctrinated into this this yes. thing yes yes and just the overall sense of sex being a very scary bad thing when mm -hmm. you know i feel like my work so much of my work is rem like giving people the info that like none of it's as scary as you were taught like you were intentionally taught to fear something that is such a normal healthy part of your personhood mm -hmm. and it is so hard for people to let go of those fears when those fears for many of them started from their earliest memories like fear of their own bodies fear of you know especially like the opposite gender all of that stuff yeah yeah and the messaging obviously varies i think depending on what high control or just regular religious group you're coming from but like even i think in in non-religious sex ed like there are these huge gaps one of the my favorite topics to bring up when i have like informed people is like what like health for like a hymen looks like because th it, there's this huge like patriarchal bullshit around it and yes. it's not based on medical science it's no. not based on anything and so That's... even people who aren't coming from <laughs> religious backgrounds are getting like weird kind of i don't know skewed information it's so true and i have to say that in my work with folks i do not just a lot of re-educating um, of the things they learned from their religious backgrounds but also from the crap that pop culture throws out about sex like mm -hmm. there's so much misinformation everywhere that even if you weren't raised in a religious environment you probably come to believe a lot of things about sex that are just plain untrue are really, really skewed. So that misinformation is, you know, when I work with people, it's not just correcting necessarily the, the church stuff, it's everything. Yeah, and that that misinformation is is weird how I think ubiquitous it is, right? Like, <laughs> Very I grew much. up fundy, so like I got a, a bad information, but like once getting out of the church, still seeing like how many people have kind of like this incorrect information and and like around losing your virginity or a lot mm -hmm. around like sexual health or how like STIs work. Like there's so much bad information that is being disseminated to people through not like a very formalized system. Oh, so true. And I, for that reason, when I work with folks closely, I often say to them, even though you were raised evangelical, you probably now know so much more about sex than the average American person that wasn't because you intentionally sought it out and you intentionally like sat and thought through your sexual values and thought about what you want to know and you made the effort to get that information. Whereas I think if you would just stop any old guy on the street and say, tell me a, the truth about the hymen, tell me a little bit about sexual communication, tell me how the morning after pill works. Like, I don't think, you know, it's gonna be like one of those late night, like uh, late night TV shows where they just like put a microphone in someone's face and see how like bad they are at like right. third grade science, you know? <laughs> that's that's gonna happen so 
sometimes the people that have to intentionally deconstruct and find that information they end up so much more informed than the average person that's like in the dating world sure yeah and and i think it's interesting i i talk about deconstruction as like a a break with a belief system or like pulling on a thread around doctrine or, or dogma and then deconversion is like the process after you've deconstructed of like all that like stuff that you kind of absorbed as a sponge as a little kid like your brain just soaked it all up and it wasn't like implicitly or like explicitly stated like hey like you know sex for me growing up was just a taboo topic like not only did i not get education it was just like a blank space like we don't mm -hmm. talk about it and so like yep. you pick up all this shame and guilt but nobody's saying like you should feel guilty about this it's that implication or that implied kind of thing that you absorb of like oh this is this is not yeah. safe to talk about yep and that message you know the silence is it's a very strong message yeah and then you get like the weird purity culture values of like chewed up bubble gum or rose petals or tennis shoes oh. that have been worn or like oh. you know all these yeah. like i'm just triggering a bunch of people right now right the cup of water that's been spit in by every kid in the room yeah yeah, and it's so a like there's obviously a patriarchy in there. Like there's all this and evangelical fundamentalism. Like the Abrahamic religions are patriarchal by default. Like that's mm -hmm. the point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like the sex ed then gets really murky for this this idea. Like we're not helping um, people who were assigned female at birth like understand their bodies, and we're not helping like my experience as as someone who identifies as male like men don't benefit either unless no. they're like put in a position of power and and a lot of guys aren't they're supposed to be and so like working with guys on for me like working with guys on it has been really interesting because they have mm -hmm. this idea of like i'm supposed to know all this stuff i'm supposed to be making the decisions and i mm. don't have any information to make an informed decision yeah I have um a lot more male clients than i did when i started this particular facet of work and i'm so glad that more and more uh guys are coming to me for this specific kind of education and i know that you know women or female assigned people and queer people they bear the brunt of purity culture but it is not good yeah. for anybody and you know the men i work with a lot of them have been so shamed about just absolutely regular old healthy sexual functioning like desire fantasy masturbation like all of that stuff and a lot of them also feel like they are in danger of harming women just by being attracted to them and that is yeah. something i constantly <laughs> i just well, get so upset about yeah and and i think for a lot of um people like learning doing their own education learning about things like consent and like growing in their own um, knowledge around it is really great, but it still can get really skewed and messed up in your head when you haven't totally like deprogrammed some of that purity culture stuff, like avert yeah. your eyes. Like that's a big purity culture thing for guys is to like yeah. bounce your eyes away from something that's stimulating. Oh, and so totally. like, then consent, a topic like consent gets all messy in your head if you haven't like challenged like, oh, hey, this idea wasn't based on anything. Like that was never helpful. Yeah. I've worked with men who are, you know, in their 40s and they're like, I don't understand, like, how do I interact with a woman in a social setting if I notice she's attractive? What's creepy? What's not creepy? Am I going to, like, is she going to notice if I notice her? And and it is, it just makes me really sad that this wasn't, you know, something that could be learned through just like average teenage socialization. Um, right. That it had to be like so controlled that by the time somebody's deconstructing it, like three decades later, they're they're just baffled by stuff that you know a lot of people take for granted. Right. Yeah. And I would say even earlier, like for a lot of people, when they kind of like start getting that body awareness around five or six, and like they are aware that like, oh hey, I could touch my genitals and something uh -huh. happens. It's not sexual at that age. Yeah. But like, it's just a lot we, of we know when something's soothing you know right and a lot of that gets shamed like a lot of that is like these huge crises or like you know it gets put into a box and you're not allowed to talk about it ever and that yeah. sticks with people for a long time 
forever. Um, I'm sure we hear a lot of the same stories about, you know, the time I was scolded or actually like physically abused because I was doing something that I now understand was a normal part of like sexual healthy development. Yeah. Or healthy so, sexual development. Right. Uh, you not being raised in a, in a high control religious setting, like what was it like for you when you kept hearing this? Was this like uh, around some of the political stuff where like the, the push for like row turning overturning row became a bigger deal? Or was this like, why do these people keep talking about like this? Cause I think purity culture sounds so ridiculous when you're not raised. In this. <laughs> it does. But I mean, so the way I'll just give you a little bit of background on how my family is. Um, sure. I describe us as casually Christian, you know, like, in in the like american corporatized like we love christmas um you know at easter i would get a big basket of candy but we didn't go to church like we sure. never went to church occasionally we'd go to church on christmas eve and that's because it was like oh the lights and the candles and it felt very festive um yeah but you know i wasn't raised to fear god i had mm -hmm. no none of that and so that was something that i didn't fully understand how that affected people until I started having these conversations. Um, even just at the beginning of my work with people raised in purity culture, I knew enough as a, at that point, a sex educator of nearly 20 years, I knew enough right. about sex education to be able to like assess what information was needed and give it to people in a really sensitive way. But I have learned so much about the things that go on in like high control religions in cults. Um, many people self describe as having been raised in a cult mm -hmm. and it, I tell people every time I work with someone, I'm like, there's nothing I can hear about sexuality that shocks me or is that's going to give me a, you know, a startle. I'm like, I've heard it all. I I'm very good at a poker face. But the things that folks tell me about their religious upbringings or things they heard at church or things that they were told to believe, I cannot stop being shocked by that, honestly. There will come a time when I'm sure that it's like also just like, yeah, I've heard that before. But every once in a while, I hear something new and I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> like, it is it is such a different world than the one um, than the one I was raised in. And it's so clear to me how abusive it is to children to mm -hmm. teach them to just constantly be in fear that they are essentially like never good enough and that they are basically not shit. <laughs> um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know. I was like a 40 year old woman when I started doing work with people raised in purity culture. And I didn't know that's what it was like. I learned yeah. so much from my clients. Yeah. And I, my my own personal like deconstruction i always say started when i was like 10 just took 20 years to actually finally formalize <laughs> um but it was it was one of those things where like for me like that fear of hell which you was taught to me as a little kid yeah. kept me in it for a long time yeah. and then having my own children was like i'm not doing that to them like there is like i'm a psychologist i've mm -hmm. been a marriage therapist for 15 years like it's one of those things where it's like there's no developmentally appropriate way to teach a kid about hell like that's and, and i've heard that story that exact thing from one of my closest friends who you know has become my friend in recent years and she her the cornerstone of her deconstruction was her first baby and looking at the baby and being like I'm supposed to teach you that you are essentially worthless. Like right. I just can't do that to a baby. Yeah. Yeah. And it and so it's I think it's fascinating to kind of see like culturally the big step away from church and then also when like you get to work with people on such a personal level like mm -hmm. hearing some of their the like their own personal journeys and and stepping away. I love um that there are people who are working with this and seeing that it's a problem that weren't raised in it because I do think there's there's benefit to having the lived experience. Yeah. And I also think getting that like outsider perspective is is insanely helpful for people. Yes. You know, I will I will fully admit that I until I started doing this work, I didn't understand what people went through and I am so 
empathetic towards folks who, you know, were raised with this information or indoctrinated even as adults. You know, when I was younger, I think that it was easy to like laugh off Jesus freaks, you know, it'd be like, sure. oh, those are the Christian kids. They're weird. And like, you know, I never thought much about them. I just knew that I was pretty from from an early age, from my like adolescence, I was very um, social justice oriented and I just didn't understand a lot of what I was seeing, um, you know, the religious right do as a young person. And, but it was so easy to think of everyone in that category as other, like they're so different from me. They're weird. They're the weird Jesus people. We had some yeah. families like that in my town. And now I'm able to just be like, I have so much empathy for everyone who was indoctrinated like this. Um, even though I was, I would have, I was always a target of, of the, you know, I've, I'm a, like a queer person. Like I've always been, I was a woman who worked in abortion care. Like I like to tell the story that when 9-11 happened and Jerry Falwell blamed like lesbians, feminists, abortion providers, I was like all three at the same time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I was working in an abortion clinic on 9-11. Um, so you know, I would have been the target of of the hatred um, of the judgment. And now I only have like so much love and care for the people who who had this experience. And my clients and everyone who's come to my work are some of the most badass, compassionate, brave people I've ever met. And I will never mm -hmm. under I will never have to personally understand what it is like to deconstruct your whole value system. I, I don't. And so I, I'm like constantly in awe of the people I work with and I get very emotional talking about it because I'm like, they're just the most incredible, brave, thoughtful, brilliant people. And you've all had to go through so much more than I can even conceive of personally. Yeah, yeah. And I think <laughs> Jerry Falwell's a... <laughs> a whole rabbit hole that I, I don't want to go to. I had a guest on early in the podcast who was raised Baptist at, and went to uh, Liberty University and talks about the numerous scandals and like just the crazy amount of cognitive dissonance for people who are like putting those people on a pedestal. Oh, um, yes. But it's it's fascinating because you talk a little bit about like you've been a target for the religious right um, for your whole career. And, mm -hmm. and probably honestly just by being female um, yeah. but it's but it's also seeing i think how like society has has grown more accepting as a whole i would say and yet the like recourse the the political pushback against that i it's i never quite have words for it it's such a like it's fascinating and also very depressing at the same time of like yeah trans kids growing up in this day and age have so many more resources available to them. And also it's super unsafe for them. Yes. Like it's this weird, like limbo. I think both extremes are present. Constantly Very much. I would have never imagined, um, you know, as a teenager or as a young adult ever seeing the uh, Roe v. Wade decision be taken away in my lifetime. I, I was I wasn't aware of all of the forces that have been working on that so hard. Um, mm -hmm. And and I find that when I talk to clients who are like, you know, not just deconstructed, but are very, very aware of how the religious right has been intentionally motivating and uh, mobilizing generations of young people to get to the place we are now, it's mm -hmm. it's scary to me that I'm like, I'm just figuring this out because I was on the outside. But those of you raised in it are like, oh yeah, this was always the the long game. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's it's interesting because you talked a couple times about like the in-group out-group dynamic. And like in, in my work, I talk very explicitly about like, that's what religion is. Like it's purely in-group out-group dynamics. It's a cognitive bias. We all have like our brain does it for us. It just categorizes people. And like, that's what religion, organized religion preys on is that in-group, out-group. Even like I was, I say I was raised fundamentalist, but that's not the word we used to describe ourselves of as course. like when I was growing <laughs> up, it was like, oh, we're not as crazy as those other Christians down the street. Like we're yeah. the good ones. <laughs> so like there's in-group, out-group within that dynamic. And then there's in-group and out-group for like believers and unbelievers and all of these things stack up, which is where I think like 
we talk i talk about it as a cult like christianity is a cult it just is the biggest biggest, biggest historically one. most successful one yeah um, but but all those control behaviors are still there yes you know i didn't i still am i learned so much about religion all all the time i like you know you know i wasn't raised in it so i'm also not any kind of theologian or scholar i i am not this is not my area of expertise but i was shocked when i learned not that long ago that like evangelicals think catholics are like not not the best christians or that they're yeah, not real I was, christians i was like wait in my in group out group thinking you're all the same <laughs> right they're all christians so, like, no, they're was, all christians i was genuinely this is a an actual quote um when i senior year of high school i went to a lutheran high school um I took a philosophy class, which looking back on it, bit of a joke at a religious institution. <laughs> uh, but like our our instructor said that he his personal opinion was the Pope was the Antichrist, like the biblical predicted Antichrist. Wow. And like, right, you look back on that stuff, you're like, that's so, but yeah, the in-group, out-group dynamics are are very strong. And I think it, it works to control people who are in the group and it keeps people who are out of the group out. So like somebody like you, who's not raised in religion, isn't aware of like this long game or how like the religious right and the federalist society had been so intertwined for years where it like in the in group of Christianity, these things are known and celebrated. Yeah. Yes, it is. I am constantly learning things against my will about, <laughs> <laughs> about <Yes>. those things. <laughs> well, and so, so like in your work, uh, how do you kind of balance that, that, gentleness of like these people were indoctrinated into it and like not their fault like mm -hmm. they're victims here and also work against things like disinformation or against people who are like misinformed or like have actively buried their heads in the sand around topics like abortion ah uh, um that's such a great question i hope i'm gonna answer it i hope i'm gonna give you the right answer to the question um I mean, I uh, I think I've always been skilled at working with folks who were very different from me. And I say that because for 17 years, I worked specifically with young people who were in the Philadelphia juvenile justice system. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I, I had a very different life than, than a youth who was born and raised in a like the criminal justice system and has family criminal justice system involvement. And so my work with those youth, I was able to be just like super compassionate and understanding, even though I didn't share their experience. And I, I feel like that translated very well to then working with people who were raised in high control religions. Cause it's like, I didn't come from this system. I can see it clearly from the outside. And so I want to, to be able to help you. Um, and I feel like I lost the train of thought about the second part of your question when you said something about like people who have their head in the sand about certain <laughs> well, issues. Just balancing, I think, the empathy of people who have been, you oh, know, victimized, yeah. but also like oh, needing yeah, yeah. to take a firm line on like misinformation oh, okay, okay. or, you know, the way that I have come to see this work is like, to me, any time that I am welcoming and kind and compassionate to somebody who is hurt by high control religion, I feel like I'm pushing against that system. It's like mm -hmm. I'm, I get to take all of the people that were harmed in some way and be like, come to me and I can help you figure things out. And so even if, and I have had clients who, you know, still have some beliefs that are more conservative than mine and that never affects how I work with them um, because I'm not out here trying to make clones of my belief system. I don't even share my belief system really widely. Um, I'm here to get people to start to think critically for themselves or continue to think critically for themselves about the topic of sexuality. And people that I work with land all over the place. They land all over the map. Um, and for some people, they are still like, you know, I'm I'm a conservative guy. I kind of don't believe in this. I kind of get uncomfortable when women do this. And I'm like, I'm not here to change. I'm not here to make you 
feel like I feel or to turn you into some like ultra leftist atheist. Like, I just want to help you. I want to help you where you're at and give you the space to think critically and give you some of the tools to think critically. And so, yeah, I, I am perfectly comfortable working with people who, whose beliefs don't echo my own, who still feel like pretty attached to some of them. But I will say that most folks don't arrive at my work unless they've already done a fair bit of sure. moving to the left in the first place. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, owning my own business, right? Like as a, a, a sole practitioner, like, yeah, you do a little bit of that self-filtering with your your client base. That's for sure. helpful for everyone, I think. Um. I don't want to gloss over some things that I think like my background, my original background is license is marriage and family therapy is what I was trained in. Um, and then the religious trauma piece on top of it. But you said something earlier that I do want to circle back because I wanted to talk about it today, yeah. which is just that abstinence only sex ed does not work. And like uh, you said it and I was like, yes, I know all that research. Correct. Yes. Um, but let's circle back just for, for people who maybe aren't in the profession or don't know mm -hmm. some of this stuff. Like why can we say that so clearly and confidently as a, established fact. Yeah. So there have been um, decades to study the effects of it. And longitudinal studies have been done on the effectiveness of abstinence-only education in preventing unwanted sexual health outcomes. So in preventing people from uh, acquiring STIs or from becoming pregnant when they didn't intend to. And the results show that when we have given people abstinence-only education, it doesn't if it delays their sexual debut it's by like a teeny tiny amount and then when folks do become sexually active they lack the knowledge and the skills to do any sort of meaningful prevention when it comes to their health so you know there the data is out there the studies are out there this isn't just my opinion you know right yeah and and that like just across the board outcomes are worse. So um, how they personally feel about their sex lives, how yeah. they feel like they're able to have healthy sex lives in the future, STIs, unwanted pregnancies, like pick a, mm -hmm. a data point and the outcome is worse with abstinence only education. Yes. And I think it's worth pointing out that like some of the the purity culture beliefs that like undergird abstinence only education, they they end up in the public schools because anytime a school adopts an abstinence only education program, like that's rooted in in like the religious that's really rooted in Christianity. You know, it's yep. rooted in the the pushing of that into public schools. And the the little activities you and I talked about a moment ago, like the the tape and the water and the rose petals and all those, those happen in public schools all the time. So, sure. you know, when I hear those stories, it's not just like this happened to youth group. It's like that happened at so-and-so junior high. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's bizarre. I think this is, we're getting off topic a little bit, but <laughs> as somebody who's deconstructed, I think this is all fascinating. Like it's people look back to like the early founders and are like, Oh, look, we're a Christian nation, which is wildly inaccurate. But, some of like the early founders, like William Penn, here from Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. was a Quaker. And like, he was a weird, repressed, sexual psycho. Like, yeah. he was like making graham crackers and bran oatmeal so that he wouldn't have his sexual urges anymore. Like he ate, <laughs> he thought eating a bland diet would, which is why we still have Quaker oats. Like, uh, yep. that's where that comes from. Like, mm -hmm. and I think people look at that and then they connect to the present day and see it's always been there, but like, yeah, those are, not connected data points like a lot no. of this stuff started getting pushed in the 1950s post world war ii yes and then it increased under uh reagan and when the aids crisis happened and yeah became supercharged into the purity movement then in the right. 90s yeah and reagan had you know known eugenicist jerry falwell and <laughs> all sorts of people oh. in there working <laughs> with them um to, to make this issue very political and also like religiously devoid of science. Absolutely. Like, the people who are, are like, there's so much hypocrisy, I think, for people who aren't raised in religion, they have such a hard time like seeing 
any sort of consistency because it's like we're going to be anti-abortion, but then we're also going to not support free school lunches. We're not going to support maternity leave. We're not going to oh, support like, health care, any right. kind of subsidy for maternity leave. Like, yeah. yeah. And so it is it was this big political you know push that took religion and used it as a propaganda tool to motivate people. I don't know. It's very bizarre. Um, yes. Even as a Christian, like I was a liberal Christian as, before I fully deconstructed, right? I just kept moving further and further left because I was working in the psychology field seeing like, this is hurting people. Like yeah. I can't, I can't support wives submit to your husbands from the New Testament. Like that's bad. Like I'm a marriage therapist. It doesn't work <laughs> that way. So it's all this like incongruent stuff. But I think there's when it's you're raised in religion, those cognitive, that cognitive dissonance, like there's so many ways you're taught to just gloss over that. Yes. And, you know, this is something I think about. So you as a mental health provider, like it must be so frustrating or maddening to see how, you know, sometimes those wives that were taught to obey their husbands end up in Christian counseling with, you know, like a mental health, a licensed mental health practitioner who tells them to just obey harder. Yeah. So, <laughs> Right. Yeah, no. And even I started my career when I was still a Christian and I was uh, at a Christian counseling place. And like, I was often like, hey, like we can't pray, pray with our clients without their consent. And everyone else was like, yes, we can. And I was like, no, gang, like that's unethical. Oh, no. Like we can't do that. And they were like, well, we're going to because like God will protect us. And this. <laughs> so cool. I was I was, again, like very firmly like liberal progressive on that side of things. Like I said, I think my health trauma kept me in, in the religion far longer than mm -hmm. I believed it. Um, but it was one of those things where like, yeah, there's, that's a safe place. Like I'm only going to go work with a Christian counselor or um, definitely it, it ping ponging back to you a little bit, like with your expertise, seeing these these Christian counseling places that are advertising as abortion clinics or unwanted pregnancy help. And they're just fronts for some church or some yes. mission group. And like, I think some of these people are so like religiously, uh, such re religious zealots that they really believe they're helping people, but it's for so sure. gross to see like how non-consensual and how like um, deceptive they're being. Absolutely. And this is really relevant because just last week or the week before, Pennsylvania stopped giving uh, state funding to crisis pregnancy centers. And that was a massive move because before that, Pennsylvania had been giving millions of dollars that were meant for like poor women and children to religious based anti abortion pregnancy centers. And um, it was a huge victory for reproductive health advocates and child welfare advocates that that practice is going to be stopped now. But there were mm -hmm. plenty of people that were like, this is so sad. Those centers give out diapers. And I'm like, it's not what they're there for, though. <laughs> yeah. And one of the big things that I, I still see, because like religious people will contact me um, and it's it's like church does good. They'll they'll share their experience where like church has been helpful. And, and mm -hmm. my kind of response to that is like everything that church helps with could be done elsewhere. Like it, none of it is required to come from church. Like so if your example is these places give out diapers, well, like, hey, like there's a lots of ways where we can support that without it needing to be attached to a spiritual message. Like, yes. yes, let's give people diapers. Let's give people healthcare. Let's give them baby food and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't need to come from a church. No. And it shouldn't require that you like modify your own behavior in order to get those things, you know, right. that you adhere to their beliefs in order to access this stuff. That's just, you know, necessary to be alive. Right. And so then it just becomes a predatory tactic of these are vulnerable, vulnerable people. And that's who churches are trying to recruit. Yes, absolutely. Look, we we solved it. <laughs> oh, uh, no, um, it's it's ongoing work. I, I, it's a weird it's an interesting time societally to be doing work like this and working with with religious trauma or purity culture or, or, or those types of things, because so many people are leaving the church and so you have i think um what will be is starting but will continue to be like this large swell of people who are coming out of purity culture or, or are questioning mm -hmm. some of these unhelpful unhealthy beliefs and needing support in it i imagine that you see the same thing i do which is there's a wave of people who began to deconstruct with the rise of trump 
and how evangelicals propped him up. And then there's another mm -hmm. wave of people who began to deconstruct during the pandemic when they got the right. like physical separation from their churches and that gave mm -hmm. them some mental space. Um, so I hear that all the time is like, it started for me in 2016 or then it's, you know, the pandemic really drove it home. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the internet too, I, I go back all the way to like the rise of the internet that, that took away a lot of the power of those in-group out-group dynamics that the church really thrived on because now people, you know, if you're a, a, a teenager who's like closeted uh, and you're not comfortable with your identity, let's say you go to a religious school or whatever, so you can't come out, um, but you can go find community online now, yeah. whereas in the past that wasn't available. And so Absolutely. that in-group out-group dynamic is not so rigid anymore. Mm, that is an excellent point. But yeah. I, I see, yes, both Trump and the pandemic, like the pandemic in, in my line of work around mental health um, has been like, I don't know, it's just so bad for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, awesome. Uh, I, I always like to shift a little bit to lighter topics before we wrap up. Like, what are some things that you do for your uh, own uh, mental well-being? Like, how do you balance you know, being active online and dealing mm -hmm. with trolls and getting some of that negativity and then like doing some of this hard work where you're maybe hearing about trauma or you're hearing about these things. Like, how do you kind of decompress? What do you do to take care of yourself? Yeah, this is one of my favorite things to talk about because I think it's so important for those of us who could experience, you know, vicarious trauma or who are in the helping professions. I am lucky that I think I got very good at that early on in my career when I was working with youth in detention. Like you don't go into a juvenile detention center, just the very, that is a traumatic space. Like you're witnessing yeah. children in jail. So I got very good at um, not taking that stuff home with me. And for me, that means that after work hours, I don't engage with the topics that are my work. So. Sure. Example, um, you know, folks will ask me all the time, like, did you watch that show Sex Education? It's so good. And I'm like, no, I didn't because I don't want to think about sex education in my off time. I'm sure. going to watch shows that have nothing to do with the things I think about for my work. Um, I'm I'm very good at, at keeping those things separate. So when I'm on vacation or when I'm not at work or on the clock, I'm not going to read books about religious trauma and sex ed. I'm not going to watch stuff about that. Um, another thing that has always been a big part of my self-care is I have a lot of pets. I love animals. I love to caretake animals. Um, in this room right now with me are two dogs and at least one cat. I have two yeah. dogs and four cats and a foster cat that lives in the bathroom right now. So. <laughs> Um, my husband is a social worker, so we both mm -hmm. do, we both do, you know, deeply difficult work sometimes and our pets are like our happiness. Yeah. I think there's, you know, nothing that's more regulating to my nervous system than when I can just like spoon with my dog and I'm like, ah, oh. and I also, um, I have a therapist. I have a therapist myself. She's wonderful. Um, yeah. she is, uh, I always want my therapist to be a bit older than me and she is 20 years older than me. She's also a queer woman. She's so cool. Um, I do a lot of walking. I'm super into being outside. I grew up in the middle of nowhere in the woods. So get me to the woods and I suddenly feel like everything's okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. So those are some and, of my, my big ones. And a big shout out to rescue animals. Cause I believe I saw online that, that all of yours are rescues. They are, they are. Um, my dogs are both pit mixes, which in Philadelphia, there's so many stray pit mixes. Um, and all my cats definitely also came from the street. <laughs> yeah, we have we have three. We have two dogs, but we've had three rescues over the years, all from Florida. Like we work with a rescue oh, here that yeah. goes down south and, mm -hmm. and brings animals that were in a kill shelter and brings them back up here so they can get adopted. So, yep. Yeah, we had two Great Dane mixes and we have a Chihuahua. <laughs> well, that is amazing. I love big dogs. Like. Mm -hmm. I'm a big dog person, um, but the, the visual of a Great Dane mix and a Chihuahua is very cute. <laughs> yeah, we had we had the two 120 and 100 pounds, a uh, male and a female, and then our little. He's a big Chihuahua, so he thinks he's a big dog. But yeah, then he's with the, the big Great Dane. So that's so cool. Um, yeah, I think I I love obviously you know my therapist was my first guest on on the podcast oh, here, cool. so like 
advertising like yes everyone needs needs their own therapist yeah um but but walking and being in nature is so good for like processing mm -hmm. and animals too you know like there's all this this research i think we think in terms again of like big t ptsd type things for like combat veterans or people who are getting emotional support animals but like animals support all of us like yes they're I attuned mean, to our emotions as i talk to you my foot is touching a dog and my arm is touching a cat i feel like there's so often there's at least one animal that i'm in physical contact with it <laughs> most times even when i'm seeing my clients when i mm -hmm. do my own therapy i sit in the same place and my therapist knows all my cats she'll be like where's the orange one today <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah um i i taught through the pandemic and so one of the rules in in my classroom because we were doing virtual stuff was like if you have it, a pet and it comes on screen and does a trick you get extra credit so Sweet. All, all my students all my students had easy extra credit opportunities if they had pets um erica this this has been awesome i'm a huge fan of your work if people want to find out more about you want to work with you want to find more about your work like where do they go where can they find your stuff well thank you um i am easy to find online purityculturedropout.com is my website and i'm on instagram which is where i do the most like interacting with people that's definitely my mm -hmm. online hub so my instagram account is erica smith.sex.ed and you know you mentioned something about like how do you manage with internet trolls my account blessedly has has been pretty chill for that. And I restrict commenting to only people that follow me, which I think helps. So <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. But I'm it's... happy to, you know, anyone who wants to work with me, there's such a variety of ways to do it. Um, a mm -hmm. variety of things that people can afford, whether it's one on one work or just purchasing a class to watch or a workbook. So yeah, all kinds of yeah. different ways to to benefit. Yeah. And you also to uh the some of my people a lot of my people who are listening to the podcast are also professionals or therapists so you also offer consultation for other professionals yes. which i think is awesome um and so yeah like all these different ways you do the one day intensives and and lots of different opportunities for people to work with you which is great because like we said there's there's so many people who are coming out of high control religion who this work is really beneficial to yes absolutely um I don't think you and I are going to run out of clients anytime soon, which might be good for our wallets, but I think is not great for the world in general, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's it's so bizarre. I uh, spent a long time as a marriage therapist, like that's still my licensure. Um, and so people like would always make like weird, uncomfortable jokes about like their marriage when they found out that I was a marriage therapist. Like I'd get like the old ball and chain type uh -huh. jokes that are like, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. That doesn't sound like a healthy relationship. No, no. But now that I'm a religious, tra like I tell people I work with religious trauma, they'd be like, oh, well, I was raised in Catholic school and this is how the nuns abused me. And I'm always like, do you want a card? Like, I'm not, no. this is a weird social interaction. I'm not sure totally. how to respond. <laughs> well, in the same vein, when people ask me what I do, I think long and hard before I tell them that I'm a sex educator. I have to sure. get like a sense of what's this person going to, what's their response going to be? Are they going to start telling me their problems? Are they going to? judge what I do are they going to like so it is definitely you know something that I'm like should I lie or just you know <laughs> sometimes I'll just be like I work with young people because I still do have uh, some of my work with young people I just don't yep. always say that I'm a sex educator because you don't know what that what that's gonna trigger in someone yeah for sure um yeah, being in a helping profession is weird, which is why I started the podcast. Let, <laughs> let other people know that, like, hey, we we have to focus on our mental health too. Oh uh, yes, and I'm so uh, glad. <laughs> yeah, so this has been awesome. I'm I'm glad that this worked out and we could schedule a time to record. And being super generous with your time, I appreciate that. Love your work. We'll have all those links in different places that people can find your information in the show notes. And as always. Um, all my stuff is over at wellnesswithjared.com, which is where people can find all my stuff. So Erica, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And to all the listeners out there, thanks for tuning in once again. We will have another new episode next week. Take care, everyone.